So if you've been subscribed to my channel for any amount of time, you've probably seen my video recounting the incident I had when I first moved to this neighborhood. I was approached by a woman who was a proud gay rights activist, and she's this way because her daughter is gay. They've got a huge pride flag in front of their house. And so the first time I had an encounter with this woman and her daughter, she literally just goes off into this tirade about why I need to be pro-gay rights and gay rights this and gay support that, just trying to encourage me to be for the whole LGBT cause. And the whole time she's talking, now taking taking to note that she didn't welcome me, okay? She didn't even ask me my name. She just goes off into this gay tirade, okay? And while she's talking, I'm praying, okay? And I'm praying because I'm knowing that once this woman stops talking and gives me the chance to speak, then I'm going to have to ruin her day. I'm going to have to tell her exactly what I am. And that's exactly what I did. And it was that quick. I went from being the mysterious new guy on the block that they all wanted to welcome and know to becoming this monster who was a bigot and a judgmental religious nut. OK, just that quickly. And since that day, for the most part, they haven't, you know, um, they've kept their distance. They haven't spoken to me. Well, this past Saturday morning, I was sitting in my car at eight. I think it was around 830 in the morning just to let my car warm up before I take off. And I was looking through my phone and all of a sudden I get this hard knock on my window. So I look up and look to the left and it's the daughter. It's the gay daughter. And she I guess she was out walking her dog. And so I roll my window down and I say, good morning. And this is what she said to me. She pointed at me and said, God is love. And don't you forget that. And before I can say anything, before I can even respond, she just walks off. I said, And so I didn't give it much thought initially. But when I was driving away from my home, I started to think about why she said what she said. And so I started replaying in my head the first encounter that we had almost three years ago. And this is what hit me. What she just did was what she just did. Right. By pointing her finger at me and saying what she did, that tells me that for almost three years, what I initially told her on that first day that we spoke has been convicting her ever since. OK. Now, why? Why did she have to approach me? Why did she have to come up to my car and say anything? because that's how they suppress the truth. Now, what was interesting about the encounter was that she didn't say that God doesn't exist. Instead, she changed God's narrative regarding love to be all inclusive or universal. Okay, and meaning what? What was her purpose in saying that? It was this, that God loves me just as I am. And that's really what she was trying to convey with that message. And she made sure to walk off before I could respond or give any type of rebuttal to what she said. And why? Because she didn't want to hear truth. And this is the most important point, because she knew she was wrong. OK, so what can we learn from interactions like this? Well, I learned that there's no way to be, quote unquote, nice, a nice Christian. There's no way to present the things of God, the gospel, or to rebuke someone in a way in which it's going to appease them or make them like it. OK, there's no way to be a nice Christian. OK, everything about what it is to be in Christ is offensive to those in the world. Okay, you can't help this. Okay, this is why Jesus says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, know that they first hated me. Okay, to be hated by the world shouldn't surprise us. Okay, this isn't meant to be easy. It's not meant to be a cake, uh, a cakewalk in the park. Okay, this is going to be hard. Okay, it's hard truth. It's speaking truth to people is hard. Okay, and this is why Christians, in my opinion, are the most courageous people in the world because we're bringing forth a message in which we know how they're going to respond. We know how they're going to respond. OK, and we know that it's not going to be good. And we know that they're not going to like us for, for speaking this way, telling them what they need to hear to be saved. But the courage, courageous part about being a Christian is being able to do so because it is love, because it is a loving act, because we desire to see sinners saved from the wrath of God, even at the cost of them hating us. OK, we're doing a, a, there'll be a slight switch in this um, session. When I came in uh, yesterday, um, I forget exactly who, who was sharing, um, but they were just talking about some of the legal issues and some of the legal ramifications of um, changes uh, to the code as it relates to marriage and same-sex relationships and things of this nature. Um, and I've been dealing with this issue for about a decade um, and have gone from uh, warning uh, Christians about what was happening, why it was happening, how it was happening, and what the implications were, um, to now 
informing Christians about what happened and how it happened and what the implications are. Um, and talking about how it is that we need to be prepared to respond to this issue. Because the way these things have come about has led to um, not only changes in the law, but they've also led to changes in the way uh, even churches think about this topic of homosexuality. And I'll just give you an example of, of what has happened. Imagine this, imagine I'm standing up here to preach a, preach a message about, um, to preach a message about adultery, right? And as I introduce my message on adultery, I say, listen, I just want everybody to know, I love adulterers. I have friends who are adulterers. And I think that we need to be kind to adulterers. We need to embrace adulterers. Um, and I, I don't think that we need, that, that would sound kind of odd, wouldn't it? Or if I was talking about pedophilia, or if I was talking about drunkenness, it would sound odd. But folks, that's the way almost every sermon on homosexuality starts today. With a thousand excuses and explanations and apologies for what's about to come. Um, there's a reason for that. And the, the, the reason for that is the same reason that causes Christians on the whole to not know how to do, not, not know how to deal with this issue, to not know how to think about this issue, and also to not know how to respond to this issue. Let me warn you ahead of time, um, not, not that this is gonna be graphic or anything like that, um, although um, I, I wrestle with that, um, but let me warn you that we probably won't get through all of this, okay? Um, and as far as the graphic side of it, I, I really wrestle with whether or not this ought to be graphic, because one of the things I believe is I believe every person before they vote on any issue regarding same-sex whatever, needs to go to a gay parade, a gay, gay pride parade. Um, it's one of the most vulgar things you'll ever experience. It's nothing like the picture that's painted of the homosexual lifestyle. It's vulgar. And I will say this, if there was a heterosexual parade and we performed some of the acts that are performed in the gay pride parade, we would go to jail, period. We would go to jail, but they don't. <laughs>